Well, good morning, church family. It's great to see you guys this morning. My name is Barrett Bowden. I'm lead pastor here at ICC, uh, one of the many pastors that we have here at our church. And I just want to say uh, how glad I am to see you guys this morning and also how much I love you uh, more than that, how much God loves you this morning. If you've got your Bibles, I would encourage you to get them open this morning to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I know that's not perhaps the most normal book to ask you to turn to for study. All of the books of the Bible are wonderful. All of them are God-inspired, and all of them are profitable for us. And today, we have the opportunity to be in a passage that I love very much in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Listen, we are at the start of a new season here at ICC, and we are so excited about it. Today is Student Sunday. What, what? Any students in the room? Okay, a few of you at least are excited about it. Others who are kind of like, yeah, that's me. Um, But we are so grateful. Uh, We at ICC here have have had a heart since our beginning uh, to care for uh, and be intentional with ministry towards students and campuses of our city. We have some incredible campuses around us here in Memphis and particularly here around ICC. And we absolutely love students, and we love the opportunity to reach students, uh, we love the opportunity to disciple students, and we also love the opportunity to mobilize students to live with purpose for the glory of God. And so if you're a student today, I just want to say welcome. Uh, Michelle, my wife, and I came here 12 years ago uh, to begin a journey in medical school at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. That would be Michelle doing medical school, not me. Um, and uh, we very much understand what it's like to be a student and, yeah, just to, to journey through that season of life. We want to care for you well, to shepherd you well, to disciple you well, and to help you into the next season of your life, wherever that may be. So if you are with us today for the first time, welcome. We are so excited you're here. Hey, next week, we kick off our fall series. Anybody excited about studying Second Samuel? We are thrilled about it. So I want to make sure you mark your calendar and... Just anticipate our, our launch of Second Samuel series next week. There's going to be a reading plan that's going to be put out on our website this week, as well as there'll be bookmarks available for you next week so that you can pre-read before you come in on Sundays. The passage we'll be studying, and we're going to be really excited about it. So keep on the lookout for communication. This morning, I'm excited to be able to teach a message that I teach every single year here at Island Community Church. And you might go, wow, you really can't come up with anything new, huh? Just gotta reteach the same stuff again and again. This is the only message I think, I'm pretty sure it's the only message that I reteach again and again. And I do it because of a couple of things. One is I think the word is really important for us to hear that we're gonna be listening to today and thinking about and reflecting on and applying in our hearts and lives today. But I also do it because of the unique nature of our church and just the unique nature of life in general. So this morning, we're going to be talking in the passage of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 about seasons. Who in this room at one point or another would have described themselves as a transitional person? In other words, you're in a season right now or in a location right now that you don't know if you'll be there forever. Anybody? one point or another? Anybody still in that season of transition? The reality is we are a transitional people. We are. We experience lots and lots of transitions in life. And more than I think most places, we here at ICC, here in the inner city area, we have a large share of people who would raise their hand and say, I'm a transitional person. I, anybody in the room not originally from Memphis? Yeah, what a crazy share of people that is for, for a church here in Memphis. Large percentage of us here at ICC are not from Memphis. Anybody in the room say, I don't know if I want to be in Memphis forever? Again, large percentage of us, right? We uniquely are transitional people. And here's the thing. Transitions are challenging, right? They are. Moving from one city to another city is challenging. But more than just geographical transitions, moving from one phase of life into another phase of life is challenging. 
Moving from one phase of relationship to another phase of relationship is challenging. Transitions in our life are real. We are a transitional people, and transitions can be challenging. But let me say this. Transitions, while challenging, bring what? They bring opportunities. Transitions, while they are challenging, bring opportunities. And this morning, I want to talk to us about the transitions of life. In the Bible, the Bible actually invites us to consider our life journey in terms of seasons. Seasons of life. Anybody ever use this phrase, in this season of my life, or in this season, or in this next season of my life? I think it's common that we think about our life sometimes as seasons, and I'm not talking about winter, spring, summer, and fall, although you could have an overlay, but we're talking about these transitions of life. Now, if I had to ask you right now to identify what season of life are you in, what would you say? How would you put words to describe this current season? Sure, you could use things like your geography, Memphis. You could use things like an occupation or maybe a schooling period or assignment. You could use things like relationships, newlywed, dating, single. You could use things like that are emotional, um, grief, longing. How would you describe this current season in your life? I'm not talking about the one you've just come out of, but the one that you're in and the one that you're moving into. I would bet that you would say there are things about this current season that are challenging. But what I want to do today is go to God's word together and see that God is at work in our seasons And while challenging, each and every season brings opportunity, namely toward God. So if you've got your Bible and you've already turned there, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Everybody there? Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And I'm going to start reading in verse 1. And I'm going to read all the way through verse 15. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it, 
so that people fear before him. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. This is God's word, and we're going to have opportunity to look at it together this morning. I want to talk to you about three opportunities that you have in this season of your life. Three opportunities, while you may be in a challenging season, a unique season, I believe the season you're in right now and the season that is most immediately coming up for you this next year is an opportunistic season. The first thing I want us to see from this passage is this, that God is in control of every season. Will you all say this with me? God is in control of every season. If you look at verse 11, and even some of the other verses that are around there, in verse 11, what does the verse start by saying? He has made everything beautiful in its time. It's talking about all of these seasons of life. Many of you have heard this passage before, and it goes through all of these different seasons that we experience in life. And I bet that you could find some words in that passage, in those first eight verses, that kind of help to describe your current season. But one of the things the Bible helps us to see as he comes to a summary point of looking at all these seasons, he says, he has made, he has made everything beautiful in its time. In other words, the Bible wants us to know that the season of life that we're in is a season that God is sovereignly overseeing. Right now, the season that you're in, God is in control of. The verse continues, doesn't it? And it says this, also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out, what does this phrase say? What God has done. In other words, the emphasis is on what is God doing? God is presently at work in my season. The encouragement of Scripture is to realize one of the opportunities is in this present season to learn to rely more on God. This theme is presented really throughout the Bible. There's passages like in Daniel chapter 2, I'll look at a couple of places, Daniel chapter 2 verse 21 that says that he, talking about God, changes times and seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have, have understanding. In other words, he's inviting us to see the movements of the world, the movements of kings and rulers and political powers, the movements of any given season as under the sovereign hand of God. God is overseeing in his sovereign power every single season, including the one that you're in now. Passages like Job chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? And in his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. In other words, Job, even in his season of, of great suffering, is saying, I am still under the hand of God. God is very much still in control. Passages like in Romans chapter 11, verse 36. This is the last one I'll mention in, in terms of an outside passage other than the one we looked at in Ecclesiastes 3. Romans eleven thirty-six. 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Paul has reached this point in Romans of trying to understand the mysteries of the ways of God. And he gets to the end and he basically just, he gets down on his knees and throws up his hand in worship. And he says, God, I know that you are sovereign. I know that from you and through you and to you are everything. And to you be the glory forever. He's recognizing that in all things, God is still very much in control. So, the first thing that I want to show you this morning is that God is in control of every season of your life. And he wants you to trust that no matter what season you're in, that God has sovereignly ordained it. 
L- listen, friends. Do you know right now that he has you in his hands right now in this season? Do you know that? Do you know that we are completely his? That we are where he wants us to be? And that he has brought us to this point. I remember, friends, uh, 12 years ago, okay, this was 2009. Some of you were in middle school then, and I don't want to know that uh, because it makes me feel old. But uh, 2009, Michelle and I came to Memphis, Tennessee. And to be honest, just going to be honest with you, please don't take offense to this if you're from Memphis. I did not want to be in Memphis, Tennessee. I was in Atlanta, Georgia, where I thought things were much more sophisticated. (laughs) I was a Georgia boy through and through. I love my peach state. I love my Georgia Bulldogs. Allie Eklund, a dear friend, a member of our church, sent a magnet out this week on behalf of her business, and it did not have the University of Georgia football calendar on it. It had all these other teams, and I texted her immediately and said, where are the dogs? Right? I don't understand a lot of things that were going on in Memphis, Tennessee. Anybody else share the sentiment of like, I don't know if I want to be in Memphis? All right. I feel kind of lonely. (laughs) But that's just where I was, being really honest. There were other options for us in terms of med school. Uh, We were prayerfully considering those things. Michelle and I were about to be engaged, and we did get engaged the first month we were here in Memphis, got married after our first year in Memphis. But honestly, you guys, I was bitter. I was bitter when we realized that really the door of opportunity that had opened for us was going to be in Memphis, Tennessee. And I came here I came, okay? I came primarily because I was in love, all right? Just going to be honest with you. And I came here just kind of in my heart going, I can do this for a few years and maybe we can transfer to another med school for her to finish and certainly we can get out of here with residency, right? And I just had this attitude of I was not going to be willing to really fully embrace the fact that I was being moved to Memphis for this short, which felt like at the time forever season. And in my heart, what was going on was not just a resistance though to Memphis. It was not just a resistance to the reality of medical school at the University of Tennessee, even though my university system was Georgia. Uh, It was not just, yeah, that I thought that it was inconvenient or what didn't have some of the things that Atlanta had and all that kind of stuff. What was exposed in my heart after months of being here in Memphis and the bitterness and the frustration and the anger grew. What was exposed in my heart was I was actually in resistance against God. It really wasn't about Memphis or the med school or the conveniences of things that I had left or proximity to my family, which was another factor. It was that I was resisting the sovereign hand of God. God was moving us to Memphis, and I didn't like what God was doing. Anybody ever, if you're honest, had a point in which you go, I don't know if I like what God is doing? Yeah. And one of the things that had to be rooted out of my heart was resistance to God. God had to break me, and I'm so thankful to say that he did break me. By his grace, he pursues his people, and he'll break his people. If you put up resistance, he'll do what it takes to get you to a point of trust and surrender. And God did that in me over a slow period of time. But God did change my heart. But what changed was not Memphis. What changed was me. I learned that there was nothing wrong with this city. What was wrong was me. What was, it was nothing wrong with the season in which God was bringing me into. What was wrong was I was unwilling to embrace what God was doing. And when I changed by God's grace and spirit, 
Uh, he changed my heart. But when I came to a place of surrender, everything about the season that I was in began to look completely different. Suddenly, instead of frustration, I found opportunities for contentment and even joy. I began to see Memphis in a completely different way. I began to see the opportunities that were here where before all I had seen was the challenge. What changed was me and my willingness to embrace what God was doing. Some of you this morning, I really believe that you might be in a season where you are, you are tempted to resist God, where you're tempted to grow bitter against God. You're tempted to, to try to keep control for yourself rather than to recognize his control, his rightful control and ruling over you. And this morning, one of the things that I want to say to you is don't resist God. Even if you have to come to a point of just brokenness through tears, uh, do whatever it takes to come to a point of surrender, to recognize him and what he is doing in this season, and to embrace him rather than resist him. And when you get this, see, what happens is this requires humility. It produces humility, right? And with God, there's no room for pride. There's a passage in Corinthians chapter 1 that talks about who, who of you could think that you're wise? There's nobody. I mean, just look at the cross. The, the wisdom of God is folly to man. And, and look, one of the things that happens is when we're forced to surrender to God, it brings humility. It does. But you know another thing that it brings? It brings rest. Like in Psalms, be still and know that I am God. With surrender comes a rest. And I had been frustrated and upset for months and months until I had come to a point of surrender here in Memphis. And when that happened, though I didn't know a lot of things and the city was still very different, my family was still far, and you couldn't find Georgia Bulldogs on the, on the TV very much. All those things didn't change, but what changed was in my heart, I had trust in God. And that makes all the difference. God is in control of every season of your life, and what I just want to remind you of is God is in control of this season of your life. And what God is calling you to do, friends, in response is to trust him. The question is, will you resist or embrace that this season is a season that God has appointed for you? And secondarily, will you trust God with this season? Will you trust God with this season. The second thing I want to show you this morning is not only that God is in control of every season of life, but number two, that God has a unique purpose for every season of life. God has a unique purpose for every season of life. Will y'all say that with me? God has a unique purpose for every season of life. If you go back to the passage, what I want to show you here, starting in verse 1, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, he says here, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. And then he goes on, and I don't have it listed on the screen, but if you just scan again those verses 2 through 8 in your Bible... That it speaks of birth and death and planting and plucking up and killing and hilling and breaking down and building up and weeping and laughing and mourning and dancing and casting away and gathering together, seeking and losing and keeping and casting away and tearing and sowing and silencing and speaking and loving and hating and warring and peacing. Each season we see unique in its purpose and what Verse 1 tells us is for everything, there is a season. And then if you look at verse 11, 
He says there, earlier we focused on this first part, he has made, but the second part is also very important. He has made these seasons, but there is a purpose in the seasons. And what is the purpose? It says he has made, what? Everything beautiful in its time. In other words, in the midst of every season of my life, God is at work. He is purposed, and he is bringing beauty in every season? Yes, in every season. As unique as the seasons may be, you may be in a place right now where you're like, I've never been in this place before. There's something unique happening. There's something is going on that I've never experienced before. Or you may even be in a season where you're going, I just want out. This is too hard. And yet, God, in his grace, by his spirit, saying, but do you see right here, right now, I have purpose for you. Do you see right here, right now, I desire, through whatever it is that you're going on, to bring something beautiful. This is God. This is his amazing grace. This is his work on behalf of those who believe in Jesus Christ. This is his redemption. He's bringing beauty in every, in every season. God has a unique purpose for every season of life. A couple of verses I'll give you, and then we'll talk about the practicality of this in your life and try to apply it. A couple of other places we can see this in Scripture. Like in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, the Scripture says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, one of the things that the Scripture declares that you need to know about the way God is at work in your life is he began a good work in you, Jesus Christ, and he is presently, actively working in your life to bring you to the point of completion, of complete sanctification, of readiness, of maturity, that you might be with him and like him forever. God is presently at work in your life. Does that include Last season, yes. Does that include this season? Yes. Does that include every season until you meet him again? Yes. yes. <laughs> God is at work in our lives. Ephesians chapter 2 says, We are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepares beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, the whole life for us is life of Christ's followers is a life that we are walking in seasons that God has prepared for us. He is doing a work. He is preparing for us a work that we might walk in them. So in every season we find ourselves in, we are walking in a place of God's preparation. What a hope for us as believers in Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, which is a verse I taught just recently, even last week, I think. And we talked about how God is at work bringing us to knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God is presently and actively at work in me, bringing me to a point of maturity. Remember we said last week, I got some growing up to do. Y'all remember us talking about that? And what we're saying now is in every single season, God is growing us up that we might be in greater intimacy with Jesus and likeness of Jesus. You might ask, is this just for good seasons? Because the one I'm in right now, I don't see beauty. And I'll just point you briefly to a litany of verses. You need to write down the references because I don't have time to teach them in full. But verses like Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, that says, not only this, but we rejoice even in our Sufferings. Anybody here right now feel like they're in a suffering season? And even in suffering seasons, it says we can rejoice because we know that in this suffering, God is at work producing endurance. Endurance producing character. Character producing hope. And hope not putting us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. In other words, even in seasons of suffering, God is at work in good ways. God is at work in your character, 
bringing you to know more of Jesus and more of his hope and more of his love. And for that, though we despair of the suffering, we rejoice in the deeper work that God is doing. Verses like in Romans 8, 28, we know that in all things, God is at work for good. Or in James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, count it all joy, brothers, when you face trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Steadfastness. And let this steadfastness have its full effect. In other words, don't resist this. Let God work in you that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Here's what I take away and what I want to talk to you very practically before we go to the third and final one. The focus of our life and the focus of any season, including the one that you're in right now, is knowing more of God. Growing in our relationship with God. This is what it means to be a disciple. To, to, to be in a loving relationship with Jesus and to be in joyful obedience to him. And this is what we are purposed with in every single season. Is how can I know God more? And how can I grow in relationship with God more? And how can I obey him more, become like him more, make much of him more? I want every season of my life to be a season toward God. So, this is where rubber meets the road. You ready? Here's something we have to understand. God is more concerned with growing our relationship with him than anything else. He is more concerned with our character and our nearness to Christ and likeness of Christ than anything else. Which means that in any given season, you got to know that God is more concerned with this than your comfort. He's more concerned with your character than your comfort. And he's certainly more concerned with your character than your career. Sometimes we get our priorities all out of whack as Christ followers. And we look at seasons that are uncomfortable and we try to run the other way. Or we look at seasons where our career is not doing well or advancing and we run the other way. Or we make decisions on things like comfort or career before we do Christ. But what God is saying to us is, look friends, more than your comfort, more than your career, I am concerned with your nearness and likeness to Christ. And I want you to know that right now in this season, you have an opportunity to grow into nearness with me. In other words, we can say it like this. God is far more interested in who you are than what you do. God is far more interested in who you are becoming in him rather than what you are doing with life. When you get this, it is incredibly helpful and incredibly freeing. God is after your heart. I'll never forget, it was, oh goodness, I don't want to name the year because again, I'm going to feel old. I think it was around the year 2005 or 2006. I went to serve on a camp staff. Anybody ever served on a camp staff? Woo, woo, nerd fest, let's go. Um, and Charleston, South Carolina. And I was on staff with about 30 others who were of my age at the time. And we were there to lead uh, youth groups all summer long that were coming from churches to serve the city of Charleston. It was Mission Fuge Camp and to make, uh, help them know more of Jesus. And we were in staff training first week. And one of the things we knew was everybody on staff was going to have a portion of the training time to share some of their life story. I think you got 15 minutes each, and we all had a chance to go around at some point during the week and share our story. Well, I'll never forget, there was this young girl who was beautiful, who had a chance to share her story. Uh, she started out by saying, I'm Michelle Roark, and I'm from Yazoo City, Mississippi. If y'all don't know, she's now Michelle Bowden, my wife. 
And she began to talk. She had much thicker accent than she does then. Cute as a button. And I don't know why we say cute as a button. Our buttons cute. I guess they are. But anyway, um, she began to say, I just wanted to tell you all today about my life story. And she said, in order to tell you my life story, I want to actually share with you my life story in the lens of the names of God. She said, I want to talk to you about different names of God that I have learned over my years of life because I think that it's better for y'all to hear that in every season of my life, it's really been defined less by what I've been doing and more by how he's been helping me know more of him. Well, this boy from Georgia was sitting over there going, good gracious. Number one, I didn't even know how God had names. Okay, this is where I was at my point, my spiritual journey. It's like, okay, this is cool. Secondly, she is like deep. I mean, this girl is like, I mean, I just basically was like, I was born in Macon Hospital and the Coliseum, and I grew up with mom and dad. I was just giving life facts, and she's taken a whole other level of seeing something about God instead of just the facts of life. And number three was, I got to get to know this girl. And y'all, it turned out quite all right. We're married, have two beautiful kids, and I'm so thankful for Michelle and her continued godliness and example for all of us today. But one of the things that her testimony taught me right there and then was that I had been looking at life wrong. I had been looking at life just through what I had been doing, the facts, the ways I had been living, the activities, the schooling, the whatever jobs, whatever else. She was looking at life from a different lens, a lens that God invites us all to look at life through. And that is, as we think about the seasons of our life, how do we see it from God's perspective? How do we see what God is doing right now in the midst of my season to help me know more of him? If you had to describe how right now you have an opportunity to know something about God in this season that you haven't had opportunity to know about God before, what would it be? God wants to show you something about himself right now in this upcoming season that he hasn't yet. He wants you to grow closer to him and to grow more like him in a way that you haven't before right now in this season. And he's inviting you to to embrace the opportunity to seek him. In fact, that's exactly what we're saying is for this second point, the call in our life is to seek him. And the first point, yes, in every season we are to trust him, but also in every season we are to seek him. Like in Matthew 6, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God. Don't seek first your grades in optometry, dental, or medical school. Don't seek first your career advancement or money in your bank account. Don't seek first your house or your fiance or husband or wife. Don't seek that first. Learn in every season to seek him first and let him take care of the rest. Jeremiah 29, the encouragement is, seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Philippians chapter 3, Paul gives us a great example. Whatever gain I had, I considered a loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. In other words, it's not about all of the other stuff that sometimes we make it about. It's about knowing Jesus. So what I'm asking you, the question is, will you allow God to work in your heart in this season to grow you closer to him? Sure, you may define this season by a lot of things that you named earlier, but what I'm asking you is will you reorient your perspective and say, God, no matter what, whether it's Memphis or school or husbands or wives or loss or gain or excitement or grief, Whatever it is in this season, God, what I'm asking, what I want the most is more of you. And God, I'm inviting you to grow me in relationship with you. Another way to put it is this. Will you surrender to God for his work in your life in this season? Will you? I really hope you will. Third and finally this morning, and this is the most brief point, but... It does not need to go without mention. The third thing that I want you to see right now in this season upcoming in your life is this, that God is our hope in every season of life. God is our hope in every season of life. 
If you look at verse 11 of Ecclesiastes 3, it says clearly that God has put eternity in our heart. In other words, man, there's something deep in us that knows like right here and right now is like not it. We long for a strength. We long for a stability. We long for a joy. We long for a purpose. We long for a hope that is beyond anything that this world can offer. God has made our hearts to long for him. And the reason he's made our hearts to long for him is so that we might find him. So that we might live in relationship with him. And one of the most amazing things about God's grace to us in Jesus Christ is God offers us his hope. He offers us himself in any season and every season to be our strength, our anchor, our song, our joy. He offers us himself. And the encouragement of the scripture is to make him our hope. All throughout the Bible, we see passages like in Lamentations chapter 3 that says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. In other words, if you're looking for constant love, don't look for it in the things that may come or go in this season. Look for it in the one who gives it in all seasons. God loves you. And if you could understand this and just believe this and begin to receive this and live in light of this, Oh, that's the prayer of the Bible, that you might be filled with the fullness of God. If you could learn to live with strength and stability in God's love in this season, oh, friend, that is it. That's true life. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is the faithfulness of God. If you're looking for an anchor for your life, friends, your job, your health, your relationships, your money, X, Y, or Z, your schooling, your career, those things are not dependable. There is only one who is dependable, and his name is God. His name is Jesus Christ. He is faithful. Great is his faithfulness. So do you know what's good for you? Put your hope in him. In this season of your life, put your hope in him. Psalm 18, verses 1 to 3, the psalmist says, I love you, O Lord. You are my strength. O Lord, you are my rock. Lord, you are my fortress. You are my deliverer. God, my rock in whom I take refuge. You are my shield, my salvation, my stronghold. In other words, in this season... The encouragement of the Bible is, will you put your hope in God? Will you allow him to be your stability and your strength, your sanctification, your salvation? Will you trust and anchor your heart and life in the faithfulness, the unchanging nature of God, the reality and the beauty of his promises and his power, his present work in those who believe? Will you turn to God as your strength? Joshua, at the end of his life, says, I'm about to go, but I want you to know before I go, you can imagine an old person. Maybe you've had somebody in your life who's loved the Lord for a long time or even for a short time. And before they go, one of the things that you'll find coming out of their heart was such a sweet thing. I've seen this again and again with people in my life, people I've ministered to here in our community. People who deeply love and know the Lord, typically at the end of their life, will look at you in the eyes and sometimes with tears and they'll say, There's one thing I want you to know, that God is faithful. Trust him. Trust him. And Joshua says something similar. He says, I want you to know that none of his promises have ever failed. None of them. None of the good things that he's promised has ever failed. In other words, put your trust in God. Put your trust in God. Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? Why? Why do we have hope? How in this season can we have hope? Here's how. Because we know this, that he who promised is what? Faithful. He who promised is faithful. Even 2 Timothy 
2.13 says, even if we're faithless, he remains faithful. Friends, the hope of our life is not that we will stay close enough to God. The hope of our life is that he's chosen to stay committed and close to us. Aren't you grateful for his grace in Jesus Christ? God is our hope in every season of life. And in fact, God is our hope in this season of life. And the question that I'll ask you is, the response here is just, will you hope in him? We talked about trusting him and seeking him, but now the final response here is just hope in him. And the question I'm asking is, where will you, right now in this season of your life, where will you, I'm talking to you, where will you look for stability and strength right here in this season? Where will you turn? Will it be something else or someone else that's really not that strong or stable? Or will it be God who is faithful, who is strong, who is stable, and he's shown it in the cross of his son, Jesus, how much he loves us, how much we can depend on him, how faithful he is to his promise. Put your hope in God. Will you hope in God's faithfulness and strength in this season? Well, I close by just reminding us, friends, we are a transitional people. Right now, you are in transition, most likely. Earlier at the start of the message, I said that while we're in transitions, there can be challenges, but there's also what? Opportunities. And I asked you, how would you describe the season that you're in? And most likely you thought or felt something. And now I'm asking you, in light of God's word and encouragement toward you today, the spirits please, I'm just asking, will you make the most of this season of your life? Will you seize the opportunities that are before you toward God? Namely, I'm talking about these three things that we've described, trusting and seeking and hoping. Will you take the opportunity to trust him, to seek him and hope him? him? I'll put up these three questions. Will you trust God with this season? Will you allow God to transform you in this season? And will you hope in God's faithfulness and strength in this season? I pray, I pray that you will. In closing, I'll just say this for those who are new, brand new today. You need Jesus. <laughs> you need a relationship with God that is only possible with Jesus Christ. And so everything I've said today is predicated on this, that you come to a point of recognition of your sin, your rebellion, your brokenness against God, your inability to save yourself, and you come to a point of recognizing that God loves you and has done everything needed in Jesus Christ, his son, our savior, the only savior, in his life to provide righteousness for you, in his death to provide forgiveness for you, and in his resurrection to provide new life, a hope and a future, a new relationship with God for you. If you believe in Jesus and surrender to him, he can make you new. He can put the spirit of God into your life. He can bring you back into relationship with him and he will be your God again, now and forever. You need Jesus. And I just encourage you today, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, to repent and to believe, surrender, and to joyfully embrace a new relationship with God. The other thing you need, you, you need a local church. Everybody needs a local church to come alongside and to help you grow in a relationship with God and to make the most of any season. And if you're here today and you don't have a local church, you're sitting right now in the building of a good one. <laughs> the church is not the building, the church is the people. But we are a loving family who will help you know Jesus more. And if you want, we would love to invite you back and to get to know more of what God might could do through you if you commit here in our church.